So the question was then what might be the difference between prairie voles and montane voles, and I'll get quickly to the answer. And it depends on males, differences between males and females. So let me just say what in, in, very short, uh, in a very short story was the difference. In males, there are receptors for a peptide that's very similar to oxytocin called vasopressin. And what distinguishes between the monogamous pair bonders and the promiscuous pair bonders is the density of receptors in a very particular part of the brain. And that's shown uh, in this slide. And in females, what distinguishes the monogamous pair bonders from those who aren't is the density of receptors for oxytocin in a very specific part of the brain. So the prairie, male prairie voles have a very high density of receptors. The montane voles don't. Is this just a, cause, a, a correlation or might it be causal? Scientists investigating this did all the obvious manipulations. In the prairie voles, you block the receptors and, and the little rascals become promiscuous. Um, now you have to do the other kind of manipulation in mice, that is, to increase the, the density of receptors in, in the male, but you can turn a promiscuous mouse into a monogamous pair bonder. Now, it isn't just that they pair bond, but they also uh, protect the nest, they will fight intruders, they will fight others who come along and appear to be interested. The molecular biology revealed that the determining factor had to do with a promoter shown here as a, mic a bit of microsatellite DNA, which is responsible for turning on a particular part of uh, DNA that produces the protein, which is the receptor for vasopressin, and roughly the same in the case of oxytocin. Now, when I first encountered the story, I was really very interested because it seemed to reflect the Darwinian hypothesis that you might have very particular kinds of behavior having to do with cooperation and selflessness in the context of uh, the family and that that might be spread to a wider domain. And people then who looked uh, at the behavior of, of various primates found that there were certain very interesting differences in the case of primate behavior as a function of whether the males were related to one another or whether the females were related to one another. So um, the particular case I want to draw to your attention has to do with uh, intertribal conflict or between, uh, between group conflict. In the case of chimpanzees, the males largely stay within the troop and the females leave. And as you will know, the recent literature on this is quite extensive, but uh, chimpanzee troops are, are lethal and they will attack other, other troops and one by one kill them off and often kill them off in the most brutal fashion. Uh, some other primates where it's the males who leave and you have a female hierarchy do actually behave somewhat differently. Uh, that is, they tend not to have lethal intergroup competition. So certainly one of the things that, one of the questions that this raises in the context of wondering how we get beyond just the family unit to the wider group, and in the human case, how we get from those that we're not immediately related to to those that are in the wider group but with whom we share no genes, very interesting questions can now be raised in a way that they weren't really raisable before. So uh, the uh, one issue then, uh, uh, before, I, before I do that, let me just remark here um, as a kind of summary that it does appear that in a certain way evolution sets the brain's style of drives and emotions, not just in the case of social emotions, but the drives and desires to get food, to seek shelter, to 
avoid a fight or to engage a fight and so forth. And then comes the story of the reward system. And again, neuroscience within the last 15 years has begun to plumb the details of how the reward system works in mammals. Um, really important bre breakthroughs were made by Wolfram Schultz, but Terry's lab here at the Salk also works on the reward system. So it, to a first approximation, uh, apart from humans, what it does look like is that we share uh, much because it's in our genetic interest to share and to cooperate and to live within groups. And that, but that that's all underwritten by very basic neurobiology and that the specifics of convention, using this convention as opposed to that convention, comes into being as a result of the way the reward system is tuned up. And so one group might uh, settle a difference in that one way and another group in another way simply as a result of uh, conventions. So, but the question does remain, and this is one that many evolutionary biologists have worked on for a long time, what does explain human style altruism? And I think one of the things that I found so interesting about Greg Clark's uh, talk yesterday is, is the reminder that human style altruism can change over time. Um, th that is, from the, uh, not just as a result of culture, but possibly even as a result of uh, natural selection. So it's not exactly clear what human style altruism is. And sometimes I think our intuitions about human style altruism can really be quite wrong. Um, in our culture, if you raise an issue about infanticide, people are most likely to rear back in absolute horror. They have a visceral reaction to it. But as I'm sure Scott Atran could tell you, uh, even in certain cultures now, but certainly in cultures in the past, infanticide was really a fairly standard way of dealing with certain very difficult problems. And uh, it was not considered under certain circumstances uh, to be a, a, a truly dreadful thing. The case of the Inuit is extremely well known, so I won't go into detail, but it is known that because they lived on the very knife edge of survival, where having a group that was too large or too large to bring in the energy resources that were necessary to keep it going, they let the females die. Not an unreasonable thing. But for most of us who live in a culture of uh, great prosperity, this, of course, uh, doesn't seem quite right. Now, Sam Bowles and others have argued with regard to human style altruism within the group and the idea that the group can expand beyond immediate kin, um, that lethal group, uh, lethal group inter group competition uh, might actually have been an, uh, an important factor in this. 